Okay. Uh, just by show of hands, how many of you are here because this is the coolest room in the building? <laughs> All right, if that's the only reason, uh, just try to keep your disruptions to a minimum. And uh, I'd just like to point out that um, I'm already married, so I can't have a proposal during my presentation. Uh, however, for, uh, to keep the engagement high, at the end of the uh, presentation, after the questions, Angel and I will fight to the death. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so we're here for, uh, to talk about constraints and capabilities, systems thinking, and idealized design. Uh, if you are going to tweet about this uh, in an affirmative way, please use SysThink, S-Y-S-Think. Uh, if you're going to say something negative, just use somebody else's hashtag. Um, and uh, the thing I wanted to start off with is uh, this photograph here, which uh, I don't know how many of you, how many people here are, are London, London area? Okay. Have you seen this before? It's familiar. So why, why did I put this photograph up here? Does anybody have care to venture a guess? Okay, I didn't think you'd know. Uh, that's why I wrote notes up here. So th this is a cleanup crew here that organized themselves uh, using Twitter to go and clean up uh, one of the tube stations. I believe it was Clapham, one of the Clapham stations, there are several, uh, and organized themselves over Twitter. And the thing about this that I found somewhat interesting was you see that none of these is wearing the, that lovely reflective jersey that indicates that it's their job to do so. What they did was they brought their capabilities into a system that was not functioning well, right? Because of the riots, there were not enough people on staff to do these various things. And they went beyond the artificial constraints that said, you're not responsible for cleaning up the tube station. And they went ahead and did it anyway. And they made the system, which is the society, work better. So that's kind of the idea that we're going to talk about here. Uh, but we are going to try and, and make it somewhat applicable to uh, the world of Drupal. I just wanted to make a link with what we heard this morning. We were talking about a system, a design system, and the ingredients of that were a grid, a typography, a hierarchy. But what we're going to talk about today, we're user experience people, and we exist because it's not just about flat design. The web is transactional, so there's more to it. That's not enough. That's not going to get you to good design. There's a whole band of activities and research stuff that you have to do beforehand to allow you to plan the journeys, to plan the functional needs, and to get people to their destinations. And that's where user experience people come in, like us. Go ahead, Rachel. OK. Well, I'm, I'm Angel Brown, and I'm UX director at Digitas Health. I've been there since January. Um, I've been involved in web design since pages were gray thousands of years ago. I remember finding out tables, that's how we can do things. I mean, that's a long time ago. But I'm, I'm really a designer, but I'm a geek as well to a certain extent. I had my own agency for 10 years and I had to run all the tech teams. So when they couldn't solve problems, I had to do it because the bu buck stopped with me. So I, I'm pretty savvy and I like looking at code. I like understanding how things work. And I particularly like Drupal. Digitas does a lot in Drupal and I've been working on it since I joined and it's going to talk a bit more about how we relate systems thinking to Drupal. And uh, my name is Dante Murphy. Um, my primary uh, professional achievement has been s being smart enough to hire Angel. Uh, uh, <laughs> as, uh, as the leader of the global experience capability, um, I tend more to think sort of uh, conceptually and try to establish frameworks. So uh, all of the high-minded things that are going to be said today are, are probably going to be said by me, and, uh, and Angel is going to help give you guys some context for how to use mm. them. Uh, but together, I think that we're coming from the same, the same mm. perspective. I was, a, I was a coder before the web. Uh, yeah, my, my first program that I worked on was actually written before I was born in 1964. Uh, it was written on punch cards in, uh, in COBOL. Uh, anybody here a COBOL programmer? <laughs> there are Love some. for you back there. Fantastic. Love, love, yeah. OK. So yeah, and, then, and I haven't written a line of code since then. Uh, and and I, I don't miss it a lot. Uh, design is where I belong. So, uh, moving on. So what, all right, so how many people in this room are, are designers? Lovely, no, lovely. Good. How many people are developers? 
How many people raise their, bo yeah. their hands both times? <laughs> you are the most You're wonderful great, people yeah. in the world because you understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, you understand that, that development is a design activity, and I think that's, that's why you're in this session, probably. What, what is it that we strive for in design? Who would like to just call out some things that we strive for in design? Simplicity. Simplicity, okay, that's great. What's another one? Organization, Organization. okay. What'd you say? Mm -hmm. Beauty, okay. Yeah, Beauty we is good. Clarity over here. Clarity, mm -hmm. excellent. Mm -hmm. Usability. Good one. Yes. Functionality is important as well. Yes? <laughs> that one? What he said? <laughs> Delight. Yes. yes. Mm, affordance, affordance, yes. Yeah. Okay, so now you're geeking out a yeah, little bit. Are, I, yeah. And we love it. <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that, uh, that several of the concepts that we're going to talk about uh, are included. Uh, specifically, uh, well, these first two were definitely mentioned. So uh, do we have anything else to add on this slide? Well, we were going to talk about Edsel. Oh, the Edsel. All right, so does everybody, yeah, that's what this is. Who drives one? All right, I didn't think so. So I won't offend anybody. This is one of the most epic failures of design. And one of the reasons for that was there was a lot of design energy that went into it. It wasn't for lack of trying. Uh, it was for lack of vision. And a lot of the decisions that were made that, that went into this car, some technological advances that were, that were quite revolutionary, like putting uh, the, the controls for the the gearbox in the center of the steering column. No one had ever done that before. Probably because it wasn't a very good idea. But they went ahead and did that. Uh, and, and there were a variety of other things, adjustable brakes and, and the, the, the way the speedometer worked and this hideous orifice here in the <laughs> front. Uh, and a lot of it, they, they just did it because they could. And they didn't have a sense of things like simplicity and, and beauty and, well, maybe they were thinking beauty. Mm -hmm. right? don't want to know what they were thinking when they put that on there. Mm -hmm. uh, so th s some of these ideas came from a perspective of just, well, we can, so let's. And, and I think that in the immature days of technology, we've seen a lot of that. I mean, who's plugged in a module just to see what it would do? Right? Mm -hmm. I'll put my hand up too. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, so we've all kind of done that. But I think that we're starting to, to learn a little better. Mm. So one of the first things that we talk about is function. Has anyone read this book, Sign of Everyday mm -hmm. Things, or any, any of Don Norman's books? Uh, actually, if you read his books in order, you get to see an interesting evolution of design principles. So it's, it's really important that a thing not only has the attributes of functionality, such as a handle and a spout and a lid. W would anybody care to pour this cup of tea? Look carefully, right? You know, not unless you were wearing a Nomex suit. Uh, they have to work together. It has to be a considered effort towards design. In some cases, especially when technology products are immature, the functions become the design in that sense. Applying focus to the functionality helps the products mature and become more meaningful to their users. I think we all know about form versus function the design principle, everybody, man on the street knows about it. Obviously here, you know, these things aren't going to work. Podium would have been great. Mm, this, yes. this show. Uh, somebody else mentioned simplicity. Has, who's read this one? Laws of simplicity? Uh, it's okay. It, I don't know that I give it a glowing endorsement. Conceptually, it, I love the idea. Uh, the specific laws of simplicity that, that Maida uses here are okay. Uh, would anybody care to tell me what simplicity means? Who said simplicity when, when somebody mm. called that mm. out? So tell me yeah. what you meant by simplicity. It, including the, the smallest amount of things on the mm. screen to get done what you need to do. Right, so mm. it, was, it was what you need to do. Uh, does anyone think that simplicity means unsophisticated? Well, that was a leading question, wasn't it? Mm. Uh, yeah, it's, it's subtra Maida says it's subtracting the obvious and adding the meaningful, and, and there's a reason why that quote is up there. But it's, it's putting in the things that are necessary or evocative or exude one of those affirmative principles that you guys talked about, like beauty and delight, uh, other, you know, other words for engagement. Uh, 
usability often means taking things away. Uh, and that's what we're striving for when, when we're talking about simplicity. Another key, uh, and I didn't hear anybody say it specifically, but I'm sure that uh, you'll all agree when we're, when we're designing, is we're, we're thinking about efficiency. How can we get done the most with the least effort? Not necessarily because we don't want to put the effort in. Is anybody in here lazy? Besides me, that is? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, too honest. Um, but, it's, but, but realistically, I think what we're, we're trying to do is we're trying to get the most done on this initiative or project or product so that we can move on to the next one, so that we can continue to do great things or, or make great money or, or whatever it is that we want to do. And when we're thinking about efficiency, one of the ways, as said in, in the quote here, is that you use the things that are around you, the things that are available, rather than creating things of your own. Um, I think in many ways that's the essence of Drupal, mm. right? Mm. So that you, you have a framework that does a lot of the heavy lifting for you, and then you can apply the unique aspects of your design as you go forward. Right? Mm -hmm. So we want to talk a little bit about uh, how these attributes of design, these affirmative attributes of design, are also ways of describing a system, because that's what we're talking about today, systems thinking. And it's difficult to characterize one part of a website, we're talking perhaps a block, as efficient if the navigation is incomprehensible or the login is unresponsive. We're talk we need to think about it holistically. Therefore, we want the system to express those desired attributes of, of being navigation to be comprehensible and the, responsive, the login to be responsive. So, but within the domain of systems thinking, we need to explore this a little bit. What is a system? So wh what are some kinds of systems that we work on? Let's hear them. Fuck all. You're going to have to bleep thing. that one out. <laughs> we are experiencing technical difficulties. Yeah. Please stand by. I think this is Yep, weird. nicely yes. done. OK. Uh, so who would like to call out uh, a system besides the system of swearing into a microphone that I've just <laughs> so ably demonstrated? Uh, wh what kinds of systems? Public transport, mm. very ni okay. nicely read. Uh, anyone else? Operating systems, mm -hmm. right? So that's a framework for technology. Yep. Design system we had uh -huh. earlier. Mm. There, there, are, there are political systems. Mm. There are economic systems. There are ecological systems. There are all different kinds. Um, and I think that in the Drupal context. Yeah, well, we can think about it in terms of the technology itself. We've got our core. We've got our modules. We've got our themes, etc. But you can also think about it in terms of the system being the project that takes a group of people and a technology through the process to the end. So therefore, all the moving parts are made up of subsystems, and that's the systems thinking way of looking at it, with information flowing in between the subsystems. Right. And there, all of those kinds of systems are very complex, mm. uh, many moving parts, many dependencies, uh, when we're talking about something as finite as a project or something as broad as uh, a mm -hmm. government. Uh, yeah, or a client, you know, oh. that, you know, the client wanting it to be blue. This is something that's significant. There is that. nothing yeah. nothing more complex yeah. and more of a moving part than a client. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so here we have an example of uh, thinking about the functions. What is the function of this system with which many of you are, are familiar? What is the function? What does it do? So moving people, move, but not just moving people. Like you can move somebody from here to there. This system doesn't allow you to move somebody from here to there. So why is that important? Because the the limits of the limits of the technology. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, The technology is limited in what it can do. This, the, 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 the system that we are able to create and control is limited in what it can do. Thinking about it in the broader context, if I want to go to a theater over here, I can get off this system and apply my own capability of walking there. And I can get there in that manner. Or having someone fetch me at the station. 
or taking a bus or whatever else. And part of that is understanding what the relationships are within the capabilities that we control. So these help us to understand what's possible at any given moment, the relationships between these capabilities. And we were talking about simplicity earlier. From a UX perspective, each blog, each thing you put on the page communicates something to the users. And in my own experience, I've had evidence where users sat and saw, oh, there's a login th and in a prominent position. Ah, I'm, I'm not going to go to this site because it's a community. I don't want to invest time in this. I don't want to have to build a, a profile, etc. So just by making it there in the default spot, it's communicating something. If you move it to the top, small link, ah, maybe I'll engage with the content. Ah, okay, this is the type of site for me. I will make the investment then. These are small things, but every, everything is significant. And they all contribute to an efficiency, right? So achieving your goal without having to put all those extra things on or putting them in the correct context. Mm. Uh, there's also external influences that control the way a, a, a system uh, functions, such as an industrial action. Anybody here uh, not from the UK or not from Europe? Okay. I love the term industrial action because it sounds so positive. <laughs> like, I, I wish that in the States we had industrial action. I would feel so much better about it, and then I find out what it mm. is. And I'm not so chipper about it. Mm. Uh, but this is one, one of many ways that external factors can influence how the system behaves. And the system has to be designed to account for that. What happens when there's heavy snow? What happens when there's an industrial action? What happens when uh, there's a bus strike and there's an, a, an added amount of people onto it? These are the things that we have to account for. Uh, another factor is what else does the product do? So if I'm thinking about designing a train station, well, what do I need there? I need some track, and uh, you know, a roof would be nice, and uh, perhaps some signs that tell me which train is where. But wouldn't it be nice if there was a place to go and get a nice fish and chips uh, also? <laughs> and why would I want that? Has anybody here ever purchased food in a train station? Come on. Has anybody here ever purchased food in a train station? All right, okay. then. So it's not because you thought, oh, I, I, the, the, the pinnacle of haute cuisine is going to be at Waterloo Station. Uh, no, that's not what you were thinking. It's that it was convenient because it was part of some other activity. I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about simplicity again and avoiding bloatware. As techies, we all know performance is a key aspect what we would try and think about when we're making a decision to put another module in. What does it bring with it? How much is this going to slow it down? But what the way I like to think about the users in, in terms of their attention being almost like a performance metric. So if you've got lots of things on the page, their attention, then it's difficult for them. It takes too much effort, too much cognitive effort. It's a bit like, don't make me think. So you find that these features can create barriers, and they, they get exhausted, and they leave. Consider the first, uh, the first mobile phone you had that had a camera in it. Um, I don't know how many of you thought that that was a wonderful idea at the time, or if it was just like, well, it's there, or if that's the reason you went out and got that specific phone. Uh, but at the time, it was an option, it was a feature, it was something that not many people opted for. Now, uh, my neighbor works uh, for an aerospace company where you're not permitted to have a camera on the premises, so he had to go and find a mobile phone without one, as difficult mm -hmm. as it was to find one with one 15 years ago. Um, and that ancillary feature has now become a de facto requirement, but it's taken time. It took time for the context of use to demand that it was that that was something that users expected. He keeps talking as he mm. resets the presentation. There are also emotional drivers. Now, I don't know how many of you would choose which tube station you get on based upon the quality of the musician mm -hmm. who's playing in the hallway. Uh, you would have to be either fantastically good or completely awful. Um, and I've experienced both in my life. Uh, but we can think about this also in a digital services context. How does emotion play a part 
in decision making or in workflow. And sometimes it's relevant in things that you wouldn't expect, such as a banking site. We were talking earlier about Mint and just the way that you use it, it, it actually, we're thinking of gamification aspects of that, it's actually fun to use, fun. And I even in a context of, say, a banking site or maybe a news site, it's, it's not something you would normally put at the top of your priority list. However, it drives the engagement. Who, who here has heard of gamification before? Quite a few of you. How, can anybody think of an example that, that they have used where gamification has, has played a part in, in, in their decision? Yes, sir. Your LinkedIn profile, the more, uh, mm. the more you complete, the more mm. full it puts a bar at the top of your profile and it keeps that, profile, that bar there, percentage bar, until it's gotten you to fill everything in. Well, it, you, and, uh, and then it'll vanish. You don't have to fill everything in, but you log in and see it, and you think, oh, I haven't filled it up yet, and you feel compelled to do a bit more with it. It's passive aggressive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's slightly irritating, but it depends on how obsessive compulsive you are. For those who are not necessarily obsessive compulsive, is there anyone who can think of something that's fun? It's fun that's functional, yes. Uh, achievements on websites and point mm. systems. So yeah. where, as you've completed your profile, for instance, uh, which I don't perceive to be aggressive, you just get a, an achievement, or if you have yeah. visited a number of sites or something like that. Or the four-square badge concept. Mm. Yeah, that's one. There's uh, reputation points on boxes mm. and arrows. Who's old enough to remember that? Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. uh, I, I didn't turn around because I don't want to know. Um, so that's, that's one of them. You said you're a bit? I did, yes. I talked okay. about emotional factors. On, We're on, on the next we slide. Okay. Um, so we already talked quickly about the idea of offline capabilities. Um, you know, we could have that tube map actually go everywhere. Uh, but that would require not only a lot of digging, uh, but it would also slow that system down because the tube would have to stop every 100 meters. Instead, we have a system that's designed for long-range transport. Let's see, can you remember how to I do this? All now. right. Okay. I'm teaching a skill here today as well. Uh, so we've got the tube system is designed for longer distances, and then we have a, an ancillary function or, or a related system, a parallel system of buses that are designed for shorter journeys. Yeah, and you know, we're talking about bloat again. Another key factor to think about is the environment in which your device or system is going to be used. In some cases, that environment is physical. In some cases, that environment might be uh, service-oriented. How does your tablet device work when it's not connected to a network or a projector, much like our device is not working right now? Uh, or or how, how does it relate to uh, noise levels or your emotional anxiety? That you may be uh, that you may be undergoing. Uh, one of the things that that we deal with a lot in our in our work is people who are getting bad news about their health, and it's very important that somebody understands the implications and the options when they hear the word cancer. But when you say the word cancer, the next 50 things that you say to that person they don't hear because they're playing a movie of their life in their head. They're either playing the movie of what's happened or what's going to happen. And that's a reality. So when you design your system of communication, understanding the environment in which that communication is going to take, that cognitive environment mm. is extraordinarily important because you can't assume that they're going to remember anything that you've said. Another critical factor is time. Now clearly, on the tubes, time is very important so that you know when the trains are coming and how long it takes to get from one place to another. It's possible that your system uh, is not necessarily as time sensitive as a transit system. But one thing I can bet you is that the people who are using it are time sensitive. No matter what it is they're doing, whether they're doing a Sudoku puzzle on their, on their phone or whether they're filling out some sort of, uh, they're booking a, a holiday, they've got other demands on their time. So we have to be sensitive to that. And thinking about all of these things as functions that we need to account for in achieving that simplicity and that efficiency mm -hmm. that makes our design good. Uh, and the last thing is appearance. 
So we know that appearance, uh, whether it be you know something grid-based and, and typography-based, or whether it, it just be the way it's presented around other things, can trigger trigger a functional reaction. When they established, a, uh, when when they, sorry, uh, what they see first establishes a context of their experience. The example that you were giving about the login blocks. That becomes the appearance of the site, the, men the mental model, the way that somebody pictures something, and it impacts how they use it. I just wanted to talk about that historically, people used to say Drupal sites all look the same. I think we've changed that a lot. It, it was because people would just do out of the box, okay, there we go, let's theme it. We're not going to think about design, we're just going to theme it. But it's different now. Theming is not the same as designing. If you look at DrupalMuseum.com, I had a look at it the other day, and I thought, it's, we've come a long way. The sites are looking fantastic these days, and designers are obviously involved. UX people are involved. So, But taking mental models as a starting point, we use, I'm going to tell you a bit about how we do this now. We use constructs like experience principles. So we come up with a set of ideas that define the experience, how we want it to look, how we want it to feel. And we share this with the project team, with the client. Do we all agree these are the principles for the, for the design of this system? Uh -oh, can I do it on my own as well as Dante? No, I can't. Da -da -da -da. We get there. Okay, rich user profiles. What do we do? We build personas. You've heard of these things. They need to contain the detail that allow us to make a decision on should we add a gamification attribute here? It's got to have, we've got to ask those questions when we're going out to research. They need to be rich. They can't just be, this user is this age and, you know, uses a mobile phone sometimes. We need the detail there. Mood boards, benchmarking, these are things you as designers will know. But these are tools that we do, we use. And we're going to show you something about mental models in a minute. But we need the developers at the table because they provide the constraints. And I'm working very closely with, with my, my lead developer on the project right now. And I say, give me, give me the mod model. Give me, show, it, show it to me in action. Then I'll go away and I'll work out what we need to hide or how we need to change it. Faceted sh search, for example, is one we, we just did the other day. I was, I was thinking, I don't like the usability of how you add your facets and remove them on that example. What are the constraints? How, how far can I go with this? Could it be a che checkbox? These are the conversations we have, and this is what makes all the difference, I think, because it's not that accessible to us as, as designers to know what the modules will necessarily put on the page. It's not, you often have, have examples, but not always. This is something I really struggle with, and it, we need to work together. Right, and one thing that I want to point out is when Angel said the word constraints, what was, what was somebody who, who considers himself primarily a developer, what was your reaction when you heard the word constraint? Anyone? What do you think about that? Did, did it feel like that was a good thing or a bad thing? Good? Are you saying that you're just guessing? Or is it a good thing? Tell me why. Uh, it's a good thing because it gives you uh, a space to work. Without any constraints, mm -hmm. you can't, uh, you've got nowhere to start from. I did not pay him to say that, nor will I. Mm -hmm. But that's right, that's, or at least that's my opinion. And uh, I have the microphone. So each system, each of these system elements becomes an attribute of the customer's mental model. All the things that we talked about, functions, appearance, time, all of these things play a part. How many of you are familiar with mental models? H has anybody heard that term before? Yes, okay. Does anybody want it explained? Lucky mm -hmm. you. Yeah, there we go. Here's an example. This is from a site we did, uh, ep epilepsy, epilepsy advocate. So what we do here, I mean, this is complex stuff, trying to understand a mental map of so the way someone uh, understands the situation. But what we do is we break it down into areas, get support from others like me at the green, at the top there, express my thoughts and share my experiences, participate or host an event. These are the types of things, we get this out of the research, these are the key areas. They're almost like if you're used to working in Agile epics, perhaps. Okay, then underneath that, let's see what are the key tasks. Now I'm starting to think about the journeys that I can map out, which then I can test on the site. 
connect with others like me, find a friend, can talk to about epilepsy, feel like someone knows how I feel. I mean, this is kind of an intangible thing, but it's significant. Feel like I'm not alone. Be inspired by others like me. Read about someone who has, else who has epilepsy. I'm not going to read the whole slide, but I think you're starting to get the idea. This is how we break them down and provide a vocabulary and start a starting point for scenarios and user journeys. And at the bottom, we also put down things around content. So we're starting a content strategy at the same time. It's a map. It's quite easy to do. And the reason why you would document it is to get the project team around it, signed off. OK, this is the next block. Let's move ahead. Uh, easy to do is probably a relative term. Uh, it, <laughs> yeah. it's, there's nothing about it that any of you can't do. Mm -hmm. It does take effort. Uh, the process is generally that you look at what people's tasks or goals are. You can get this through ethnographic study, basically following them around. Uh, another word for it is stalking. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the creepy word. Uh, or, you c or you can just ask them straight up to tell, tell you what they're interested in. It, it depends on whether or not you think they're going to give you the real answer, because uh, people don't always know how to answer mm -hmm. questions truthfully. And then down here, that's, that's a research truth. Uh, down here we have content. When we're talking about content, we're not always talking about uh, articles or words that people are going to read or, or things that they're going to consume. We're also talking about tools that they might use. And in some cases, this is color-coded. It's a bit washed out for you. But there are some things here that we're saying that we're going to do, and there are some things that we're saying we're not going to do. And we're going to explain why about that in, in a few moments. Now, when we're applying the mental model to our project, what we're trying to do is we're coming up with both functional and experiential requirements. So one of the, one of the goals that our customer uh, put in there, a person suffering from epilepsy, was I want people to understand me. Well, that's awfully difficult to do functionally. We have to do that mm. experientially. So that's one of the things that, that we tried to use as a basis for creating our system. And we can have these things as these can become the targets that we design for. It's almost like a requirements document that's not technology-based. Mm -hmm. It's people-based. Mm -hmm. And part of this is mapping capabilities to the documented customer tasks and goals, essentially. Mm -hmm. So the next step then is, yeah. Is Very much so. Very much so. And if you have an opportunity to, to see Indy speak, uh, lovely person, and uh, you know, you'll book her for a half hour and she'll stay for three days. So very accessible. Um, if you have a chance to see her speak, I recommend it highly. It's a very fast read, too. And what you'll find, I'll, I'll caution anybody who reads the book, you'll read the first chapter and you go, I'm done. You're not. Mm. Keep going. Keep going all the way through, because it's the iteration and the unfolding of the process. It's not cognitively complex but actually doing it mm. and reinforcing the concepts, it's not, it's not that familiar to everybody. So I would encourage you to, to, re to get it and to read it and certainly to read the whole thing. Um, so when we're talking about this, what we want to do is think about all of those things in the mental model in terms of how can, we, how can we create, enable, or activate capabilities that will help our customers achieve their goal. Uh, it's not just about what our system is going to do. It's about what's going to happen within the environment. So what can the product or service do for its users? We've got these enormous wheels. There's a, a reason for those, because they, they go and they do these games, and it's part of the engagement of it. Th there's a reason why they're big. They're not functionally, because it, it goes faster. Um, what can they do for themselves? In the context of Drupal, we're, we're talking about functions, themes, content, and the data model. Essentially, what is inherent in Drupal that, that it delivers before we start layering on functionality mapped to the user's needs. Right, and, and it includes the things that are go around it, like uh, the governance model and the partnerships. And when we talk about community, we're not just talking about the technology component, but what are the people doing offline, mm -hmm. we're, you know, in the meat space? And, uh, and what are the regulations that are, that are in some ways constraining what we're able to do, how we're able to communicate, something that we feel very dearly in healthcare. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, one of the most important things is what customers will do for themselves because they want to. 
what this often becomes is a dichotomy or a conflict between what customers want and what the business wants. The trick is finding the confluence and the overlap. So I don't necessarily want to spend a lot of time talking about the capabilities of the product that we create because I think that you guys all know enough about how to do that. You know how to take a requirements document or a creative brief and turn it into a product. What, what we want to talk about is what users can and will do for themselves and why. Think about something that a machine could do for you but you choose to do on your own. Can anybody think of things like that? Just raise your hand. Can you think of stuff that you, you could buy it pre-made but you make it yourself? Like food? Like you can get food out of a machine. Do, do people here cook? You cook? Mm -hmm. Okay, right? Does anybody here have a bike? Okay. Can, those of you who have a bike, can you afford a car? Yes or no? Some, some <laughs> can, all right? I, I don't want to denigrate anybody who can't. Um, that's fine. But there are reasons why you have these things. What are some of the, the reasons that we might uh, have these, these objects or these things do things for ourselves that we don't have to do for ourselves? Can anybody call one out? What was it? Health, or health benefits, true, yes? Sense of achievement, great. Mm. Higher quality and yeah. tribal associations. Mm. Mm. Okay, all right. That's not how I would have said it. Thank you for explaining it. Uh, <laughs> tribal associations mean something else to me. Joy, mm. right, okay. So I'll read my list, which overlaps, I think, with, you know, expression, uh, mm. like painting. You know, you, you could go and buy art at the poster shop, or you could paint your own. That's your way of expressing yourself. Personalization is making it your own, right? So you could, you could get the, the fish and chips down at the pub and carry out, or you can make it your own way with your own spices and things. Uh, pride, sense of achievement I heard, challenge, uh, cost, availability of resources, innovation. So it doesn't exist the way you want it. Uh, these are all different things that, that make us want to do things on our own. And it's no easy task to, to get from there to deciding what blocks are we going to put on the page, but that, that is what we do. So if we think about uh, a high-rise office building, why are there stairs in it? Well, clearly there's a fire code uh, that requires that they're there. Um, and it's a redundant design in case the lift is broken. Uh, but there's also... Uh, they're also faster than waiting for the lift, especially if you work on the 48th floor of a building, uh, which I don't anymore, but I have. And, uh, or perhaps, as somebody said earlier, you just want to stretch your legs, you want to get some exercise. So there's a sense of self-sufficiency. I don't want to rely upon other things, I want to be able to do it myself. There's also uh, collectivism, people coming together to do things. Uh, for instance, in the Amish community, raising a barn. So the whole village comes together to build a barn. Now, one person could certainly not do this themselves. Uh, they could, of course, go and buy one, uh, but that's not something that, that they do. It's part of creating and building and energizing the community. And as web designers, the pool of functions and features is often the same. I want to talk about social for a moment. So we've seen with privacy things, you know, Google fell foul with Buzz last year, or two years ago, was it now? But in my own experience with health, we build trackers so that people can track, for example, I have ulcerative colitis, and I want to track how many good days I've had so I can then have a relationship with or, or send this information to my doctor. I also might want to be involved in a community, but do I want them to see how many good days I've had? Mm -hmm. Maybe not, but maybe I could surface the goal that I set to give the sense of a shared purpose in the community. These are, these are decisions we have to make. On the other hand, another project I was involved in, London Cycle Challenge, people going out cycling on the weekend. Yes, I've done 50 miles. That is definitely something that I want to share in the community. I want people to see my achievement badge, and I want to tweet it out to Twitter. Subtle distinctions here, complex world, but, but the the, pr the end game is great if you can build community through the use of these tools. And for those of you who uh, 
may not believe in the value of community in a business context, just keep in mind that earlier this year, Google floated $10 billion towards Twitter. Billion. Uh, another thing that, that people do for themselves is try to change the world, right? So when we think about what is the confluence between self-sufficiency, wanting to do things for yourself, and coming together as a community, what we have is activism. I don't know how many of you are students of the American Civil Rights Movement. I'm not sure what the corollary is here in Europe. Uh, but I like to think, how would this have changed with Google Plus? Right? To me, it's a fascinating experiment just to, to, to envision that, know who's where, what their capabilities are, being able to organize on the fly, respond instantaneously. It's a fascinating mental exercise for me and hopefully for you as well. So we talked a moment ago about constraints and how these are a good thing. Understanding the capabilities uh, that exist beyond the, the product boundary, whether those are real or perceived, can both create and destroy constraints. We can create constraints that give us clarity, and this becomes part of our focus for design efforts and resources. We can also eradicate constraints by thinking about what are the alternatives when we think about what people are capable or willing to do for themselves. So how do constraints help us? When we think about answering this question, the first thing we want to do is identify what are the self-imposed constraints. I can't do that. And get rid of them, right? Because it, you can. You can do it. You just may have to think about doing it a different way. If, if we think about, who can think, of, can anyone think of an example of a self-imposed constraint, an artificial constraint that you've overcome in your own experience? Anyone? Self-imposed deadline? Right, well, I mean, that can be motivating, though, uh, sometimes. What about um, thinking like there, there is no module for that? Is that a self-imposed constraint? Can, has anyone in here ever, ever contributed to or created a module or a theme? Yeah? Okay. So you could just as easily have said, well, there's no theme for that. We, and that would not have been a great outcome, right? So I, I think that hopefully, uh, hopefully you're getting what I'm saying here. Um, if a constraint is not helping you by giving you focus or helping you to identify an alternative, Go right through it. Just get around it some way. So either identify, actively identify an alternative or remove it. Eradicate that constraint. So if we take the example of a camera, if you were trying to reduce the cost of taking photographs, the natural assumption would be to reduce the price of the camera or perhaps the film. But if you challenge the assumption that there even has to be film, then you can eliminate it. At, and you can eliminate a major recurring cost. Then all you have to do is the relatively trivial task of inventing the digital camera, right? Well, that was straightforward, wasn't it? Um, so I think we've covered most of this here. The constraints give us focus. And the next artificial constraint is that cameras can only take still images. So if you're looking at something and you want to see it not moving, have you ever had a situation where you thought to yourself, gosh, I wish I could see that moving. Like your kid is doing something adorable. And sure, it'd be great to get the snapshot, but really what's adorable about it is how they're stacking things together or how they're playing with the cat. Does anybody here have kids or cats? You must mm -hmm. know what I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. If you have kids and cats, you definitely get it. So, mm -hmm. so now you can get a camera that looks like this but takes video. Does anyone have one? Okay, a couple, a couple, and that's an evolving capability beyond the artificial constraint. How many people have a camera and a separate video camera? Don't, don't be ashamed. All right, you're dinosaurs, soon. Mm -hmm. uh, n <laughs> it's going to happen, right? Because when, when are you going to be someplace where you're like, I only want video? Unless you're a professional videographer, it's, it's pretty unlikely. So we think about that, and then we think about what's another constraint. In order to take pictures, I need a camera. No, I don't. 
in my case, in order to take good pictures, I need a camera because this is a BlackBerry. Uh, but you don't. You don't need a dedicated camera device in order to take pictures. Well, this illuminates one of the unspoken nagging problems of Agile that is always additive. One of the most important things a designer can do, and I think we've, we've talked about this a bit, and by extension, the developer that instantiates the design is to take things away. All right, so take away all those devices mm. by activating the capabilities of other things. What this can help us to do is to prioritize. So if we introduce certain constraints that give us focus on who we're designing for, are we designing a camera for professional photographers or for hobbyists and people who have cats or children or both? That gives us a, an opportunity to really focus our design. Can we simplify some of the features and functionality, maybe reduce the, the quality of the image, mm -hmm. but enable things like video? or make it so that it fits in, into your pocket. These are the things that, that are really important. And this provides the focus, which is one of the key attri attributes of successful systems. Has anybody here ever heard the concept of, of flow, the psychological concept of flow? Flow? Mm -hmm. Anyone? Wow, Lots you guys are yeah. smart. Um, all right, can anybody here pronounce the guy's name? <laughs> His name is, is completely unpronounceable. If you want to know it, just email me and I'll send it to you. I, <laughs> I wouldn't even know how to start. Um, some sort of Slavic thing with lots of shapes and letters. Uh, he has this theory uh, about flow being this mental state that you enter where you are completely focused on what you're doing because it's both enjoyable and challenging. What is the challenge doing? activating your capabilities. So here, it's activating your capabilities of attention and reflex. It would be much easier, of course, to have a nice big sedan with you know, cruise control and, uh, and, and power brakes and steering, but I can tell you that this person would not enjoy that as much, right? Part of, it, part of the thing that makes this process of getting from point A to point B is the journey the flow state that this person is in while they're doing it. And it's a way of embracing the constraints of what a motorcycle can do and making them an, a, a positive attribute of the design. So all of these things that we think about, when we think about what the, the, the idea of constraints and capabilities and systems thinking, all of these things, if we bring it together, enable the concept of idealized design. Has anyone here ever heard the, the, con the, the, the term idealized design before? No, I stumped you, finally. Mm. Okay. There, uh, there, there was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania named uh, Ray Akoff, A-C-K-O-F-F. -F. Uh, I'll post that on our site too. Uh, who has advocated idealized design. He's written a book about it. It's a bit dry but it's a great read because it gives you a vocabulary for understanding the different types of design that you can apply to any sort of problem. The first one is to say, not my problem. Hey, who's, who's ever heard that? I won't ask you to say who said it, but who's ever heard, not my problem? Mm -hmm. o only, there's anybody here who's not heard that? Okay, just nudge the person next to you if they're, not, if they're sleeping. Um, that's absolution. Someone else will solve this. I'm the developer, I can't be bothered with design. I'm the designer, I can't be bothered with technology. There's trash on the sidewalk, someone should really pick that up. One of the reasons that we culturally abhor laziness is because it, it represents a failure to make an affirmative change beyond what you're expected to do and instead activating what you're able to do. Now, there might be a Marxist undertone to that, and we'll talk mm -hmm. about that on the break. But, but the idea is, when, when we talk about, well, I'll let you say this. Okay. Well, the success of a society depends on people solving problems beyond their assigned role, like we saw at the very first slide, beyond their own self-interest. That's why we applaud grassroots volunteer efforts, because they demonstrate the triumph of capabilities over self-imposed constraints to achieve a common goal. Right, and not my job is one yeah. of the one of the most insipid self 
impose constraints. If you find yourself saying it, please check and make sure if there's a way you can get beyond that self-imposed constraint. The next, the next highest order of dealing with the problem is resolution. Um, and it's a common way and the most obvious way to attack a problem is to deal with the symptoms. Um, but focusing on the symptoms only neglects an opportunity to address the underlying cause. So in here, we've got the problem is how do we ride a scooter in the rain? And so th the answer they've come up with is to carry an umbrella. But maybe riding the bus would have been a better, better idea. As we eliminate the constraint that says, oh, we have to do it on a scooter, we can propose then that the customer might buy a car, if they have the money, or go on the bus. So we're not only solving the immediate problem, but making it impossible for the problem to re reoccur. Right, which brings us to the next level, which is kind of a root cause thing, which is solution. What my, many designers strive for is the opportunity to understand the cause of a problem and address it before the problem can manifest. So this, this requires an understanding of how a product or a service is used. And we've talked about ways to understand this through research, through the ethnograph ethnography studies. Or we might have a study of reported defects and some creative problem solving in how to avoid recurring situations. The investment is worth it if you look at it in terms of differentiating from competitors or delivering a more efficient operation, you've got your bottom line at stake here. So if we take a look at this railroad crossing, it's, we can definitely understand how there might be uh, the possibility of a collision occurring. There's no, no blinking lights. There's no gate that will come down. And we could put those things in there and, and treat the symptoms, but is there a better solution? Can anyone think of one? Yes. A bridge, right. Mm -hmm. what, if the, yeah. what if the tracks and the road did not have to intersect? If there was some way to do that. So looking at the root cause, mm -hmm. that these two pathways intersect in an uncontrolled manner, and then addressing that. And many of us feel, or many of us have not experienced a higher order of problem solving than solution. So absolution, resolution is treating the symptoms. Solution is going to root cause. Dissolution is the highest order way of doing it. And this is thinking about how can we change the entire system? What if we were to create a society in which there were no cars? Then we'd never have to worry about trains and cars colliding. So it, this requires pulling the camera back and looking at the larger scene not just looking as a railway operator at, okay, I'll elevate my tracks at this point, but thinking about how can I create a railway system within the city that never crosses a road, that never encounters this, this but still meets the needs of people? Is there, a, is there a different way? And looking and addressing it systemically. In web development, I just wanted to talk about Agile. H how many of you are working within a Agile? About half. I've spent last year working in Agile, and as a UX person, it's very difficult because I found I was always a sprint ahead of the developers. The developers would put in time based on the things they had to deliver, and they s would say, sorry, I've got no time to think about these sort of holistic, system-wide sort of things that you're thinking about. I wanted to solve the problem once, so then the user doesn't have to readdress the same problem in different ways. But I couldn't get their time, and this is common with user experience. So, but I like the idea of Agile. There are problems with thinking about it in a waterfall way up front and trying to specify the whole system, produce lots of documentation that immediately goes out of date. No, it can't be that way. But we have to reconcile these two. I'm calling out to you because you need to help we, we need to do this together. We need to build in an agile way, but we need to be able to think system-wide as we go. Maybe it's as simple as just building in time in a sprint to consider something. I know it's always very tight. You've got to deliver something as well, but this is the way it has to be. And one of the other things that we're talking about, and, and the graphic here, you probably can't see the line. This is a set piece, right? So uh, a corner kick uh, is that you can operate within the flow of the game and, and try to do the best that you can. But when you have some guiding principles 
when you have some ways that you know that you want to try to uh, achieve your end goal in the larger context, it gives you the capability to work within an agile framework. So that understanding, as some of you as developers, as designers, how to work together within a sprint, but with a systems view. Thinking about things like constraints and capabilities, simplicity, efficiency, focus. When we think about those concepts in everything we do and apply them as guiding principles, then we're doing a better job of idealized design. We're not thinking about some pie in the sky notion that, well, maybe in phase 4.7 we'll get around to that and the budget never comes. I mean, who, does anybody here believe in phase four? Mm -hmm. <laughs> anybody? I didn't think so. You're all too smart for that. So what we have to do instead is we have to focus on the near term win, but not disable the long term achievements. So using these principles that we've been giving you are, are meant to enable you to do that, to achieve idealized design within short term bursts because you have an understanding of how to, how to think about the system mm -hmm. and the ac activate the external capabilities and energize your users and respect what it is that they want to do for themselves. If you think about something like a marathon, there's no perfect run. No matter what you do, whether you win or not, someday some young buck is gonna come along and do it faster. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't try your best, right? And it doesn't mean that you can't do something great. The, tool, these, the tools that we've given you today are meant to help you win each marathon that you run. Even though they're called sprints, they ever feel mm -hmm. like a marathon? <laughs> sort of like getting through this presentation without the slides cutting out. So we're back, okay. Uh, so you may not come close, you may come close to perfection, you may never achieve it. It's like a vacuum or, or something like that. Uh, but you can certainly get a lot closer than you would if you just focused on the near term and focused on the symptoms and focused only within the boundary of your system and the technology that you had. So that's, that's really the lesson for today is thinking about the constraints, letting them give you focus, focusing on the capabilities of people outside and using them to achieve these goals. That's it, okay, ready? <laughs> Thank you. So we've, we've got a couple of minutes. Uh, again, if you want to tweet about us, uh, we hope you will. Systhink, are there any questions? Questions? Anyone? Yes, in the back. You have to speak into the microphone because they're taping it. Um, I'm maybe went over this, I had to come in a little bit late from a boff. But uh, you spoke about doing research on users and uh, what they say they want or how they express you know, their, their goals. Maybe you do observational, you know, some type different research methods. But what people say they want and what they what they actually do ends up being different. I mean, how do you differentiate between those two things? Okay, that's a much bigger question to answer. I'll give you the short version is I don't ask them. I put them in situations and watch them. And I try to make those situations as, as realistic as possible. Uh, most of what I do these days is I, I primarily do activity-oriented research. So uh, if you want to stick around for a few minutes, I'll fill your ear until your head explodes. But uh, that's basically the idea is there are certain things you can trust people and ask them. You can ask a commercial airline pilot whether he would like to have the altimeter here or there and he will give you an honest and trustworthy answer because it is his profession and he's trained in that skill and he has thousands of hours of, of time invested in it. As a parent of a teenager, can you ask a teenager anything and get a straight answer? <laughs> no, I know this. So you have, yes. to, you have to know what kind of research you're doing. Mm. When you're talking about people who are casual users of things, people in social networks, or people who intermittently use systems, you can ask them things and be like, yeah, yeah, I'd use that, sure. Uh, I would go to a bank that offered foot rubs. Mm. Like, but would they really? You know, it sounds great. You go to the bank, you get your feet rubbed. But nobody, when they go to the bank, they don't have time for that. They need to get on to the next thing. They're there on their lunch hour, whatever it is. Uh, and maybe the guy at the bank kind of looks a little weird and you don't want his hands on your feet. Mm -hmm. I don't even know why I'm talking about mm -hmm. this. But <laughs> you have to understand what kind of things, what kind of questions you're asking and what kind of audience you're observing. Okay, does that answer your question? Anybody else? 
Uh, I'm just thinking in terms of uh, constraints and capabilities. Um, the, the point of view that with Drupal, you know, you, you'd often think almost everything is possible given mm. sufficient amount of time whether and, and, and yeah. resources. So the constraints very often in a Drupal project are budgetary. Um, so I'm just wondering whether you can give us any examples of how that constraint can be mm. positive in any way, because it's sometimes difficult to see how it could be. I can answer this. Well, I think that comes down to the prioritization process. So we've built our mental model. We understand what's most important to the users. We've also, we've got a business here who's got some needs, it's got to deliver something. We match those two together and we often collaboratively with the client, because the client has clear ideas about what they want, come up with a scope. And, and at that point, we have to all agree. And it's, it's got to be, you know, it it's goes without saying. We can't have everything. We already know the scope of what they would want. I, I don't know what else yeah, I can let, say. Me give, yeah, let me give an answer yeah. that's a little closer to home, and it's, I'm somewhat fictionalizing here to protect the innocent. Uh, suppose you work for a company that creates uh, diabetes medications, and the audiences for that, there are physicians who treat diabetic patients, and there's many of them. There are diabetic patients themselves, and there's many of those. Then there's a smaller group, and a very focused group, uh, dietitians or diabetes educators, people who are not doctors but are educated in ways to help diabetic patients control their diet in such a way that they don't make their disease worse. If we have a small budget on a project from our diabetes manufacturing client, we might say, well, we can do something and you know, maybe move the needle so much if we go after one of those large audiences. Or we can go after this small audience, really focus on them. So that same 30,000 pounds or whatever it is, mm -hmm that we would spend doing, doing something sort of ineffectual and you know, half good mm. uh, with, with the physicians, we can really focus on this audience and maybe go to the mm. conference of diabetes educators and augment it through an offline thing and then an online channel that are integrated. Now we're doing a system-wide idealized solution on a narrow audience. Mm. Now, will your client say yes to that? That I can't promise you. But it, but it gives you a framework for saying, I can either use constraints that diminish the quality of my project, or I can apply those same constraints in such a way that I can do the better project. Right, does that answer your question? Okay. Do we have time for one more? One more, anyone? No? All right, well thank you very much for coming. I hope you had Thanks. fun.